Oh. <sighs> okay. Was Ed Gein really a serial killer or just America's most disturbed funeral director without a license? You've heard the stories. The lampshade made of skin, the belt made of nipples, the farmhouse of horrors. But here's the twist most people miss. Ed Gein wasn't actually a serial killer. He killed two people, Mary Hogan and Bernice Warden, and yet he became one of the most infamous murderers in American history. Why? Because of what he did after they died. And as a funeral director, that's exactly why I wanted to cover this story. Because when I first heard about Ed Gein, it wasn't the gore that caught my attention, it was the smell. Police reports describing a sweet, heavy chemical order. <laughs> or order. Order. The order. Oh, Minnesota accent here. <sighs> Police reports describing a sweet, heavy chemical odor instantly made my mortician brain light up. Ding, ding, ding. I know that smell. It's the same chemical signature I work with every day. Formaldehyde. 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 Except he was using it wrong. Very wrong. So this video isn't just another true crime retelling. It's the death care breakdown of a man who tried to play embalmer, failed miserably, and turned his home into a science experiment gone horribly wrong. I'm Lauren the Mortician, and today we're digging up, literally and figuratively, the morbid truth behind the man who blurred the line between mourner and monster. Cue the intro. Anyways, Plainfield, Wisconsin, 1957. A town so small, you could hear your neighbor sneeze two farms away. Ed Gein was a quiet handyman, the local oddball, if you will. His mother, Augusta, ruled his entire world. And when she died in 1945, his sanity went with her. He sealed her bedroom like a shrine, clean, orderly, untouched, while the rest of the house decayed into filth. Think of it as grief frozen in one room and decomposing in every other room. The kitchen reeked of mildew, dust, and something heavier. Sweet, metallic, unmistakably human. For a decade, townsfolk wrote him off as strange but harmless. That illusion shattered on November 16th, 1957. Police came looking for Bernice Warden, the missing hardware store owner. They found her truck outside, and inside the shed, they found Bernice herself, headless, hanging upside down like a deer. And inside the farmhouse, the smell hit before the horror did. Inside Ed Gein's home, they found a heart in a bag by the stove, a chair seat stitched from skin, masks made from faces, and it didn't add up. There weren't enough missing people in Plainfield to account for what they were seeing. Then Ed started talking. He had been digging up bodies. For years, he prowled the cemeteries around Plainfield with a lantern and a shovel, targeting fresh graves of women who looked like his mother. Mommy issues. People imagine grave robbing like a Halloween gag. A few shovel swipes and you're there. Reality, it's six feet of compacted clay and frozen earth. Wisconsin winters turn soil into cement. Breaking through that is hours of work by lantern light alone. Don't ask me how I know, but I do. And if you've ever watched Supernatural, you know, Sam and Dean Winchester make digging up graves look way too easy. In real life, by the time you've hit that coffin lid, you've earned yourself a hernia and a lifelong back problem. Ed dragged bodies out, sometimes whole, sometimes in pieces, faces, organs, skin. He told investigators he'd sometimes wake up in a trance, surrounded by what he thought was his mother. As a funeral director, I'll say this. The dead don't scare us. The living do. And Ed Gein proved why. What investigators found next wasn't just grotesque. It was scientifically fascinating. When police stepped inside, they described an overpowering stench, a mix of rot, chemicals, and damp air. That smell isn't mystery, it's chemistry. As a body decomposes, bacteria and enzymes break down protein, releasing two signatures 
putrescine, and cadaverine. Their why rotting flesh smells sickly sweet and metallic at the same time. Ed Gein added something new to that mix, formalin, a watered-down form of formaldehyde, the same chemical I use for embalming. Now, in professional embalming, formaldehyde cross-links proteins. Think of it like molecular Velcro. It locks everything in place so bacteria can't feed. But it only works if it's circulated through your arteries, drained from your veins, and balanced inside the body. Ed didn't know that. He soaked parts in formalin that watered down formaldehyde like he was washing dishes. He rubbed it on skin, stuffed organs in jars, and called it preservation. Without circulation, he wasn't stopping decomposition, he was just irritating it. So what the officer smelled that night was a chemical battle. Putrid and cadaverine fighting against formaldehyde. Sweet rot versus hospital burn. Decay versus denial. That's why his house smelled like a funeral home that had forgotten its ventilation system. Not because he was embalming, but because he was failing at it. People love to say he tanned human skin like leather. Scientifically, it's impossible. Human skin is about 64% water and 15% fat. It's too soft to stabilize without specialized chemistry. When you tan animal hide, you remove all the fat and use acids to bond collagen fibers. Try that with human tissue and you get gelatin. Human jello. Ed scraped, soaked, and salted his materials. All he did was create a temporary pause in decay. Skin that dried hard, cracked, and leaked oil as bacteria kept working under the surface. Those lampshades and chair covers weren't crafts, they were slowly rotting science experiments. Experts say they would have fallen apart within months. In the embalming room, we preserve from the inside out. Gein worked from the outside in and failed miserably. He failed miserably! He was trying to play God with a bottle of formalin and a kitchen knife. He wasn't collecting skin for fun. I know, right? He was trying to rebuild his mother. Remember those mommy issues I mentioned earlier? They come into play right here. Augusta Gein was devout, controlling, and his only real connection to the world. And when she died, he lost his anchor. He shut her bedroom and let everything else rot in the house. He picked women who resembled her, dug them up in the cemetery, and stitched pieces together trying to make her whole again. He told investigators he wanted to crawl inside her skin. Eee. That's not about horror. That's about pathological grief. In Mortuary Science, we talk about the importance of rituals, the viewing, the farewell, the moment that tells your brain this is real. Ed never got that. He tried to embalm his grief instead of feeling it. Funerals give closure. Ed Gein built his own out of corpses. After his arrest, cemeteries installed locks and floodlights. Funeral homes tightened security and documentation. Families began choosing steel vaults. You know that concrete box that the casket goes inside of at the cemetery? They used to use wooden ones. Now they really wanted to choose steel or big concrete concrete wants. Not for aesthetics, but for protection from people like Ed. And then came the movies. Psycho, Texas Chainsaw Massacre, Silence of the Lambs, all inspired by a man who lived in a house that smelled like embalming fluid and grief. We've turned Ed Gein into a monster story, but the real horror is what happens when someone refuses to let go of death. He wasn't a mastermind or a mad scientist. He was a lonely man surrounded surrounded by failed experiments and the stench of denial. His house smelled like a funeral home, not because he knew what he was doing, but because he didn't. He was trying to preserve what was already gone, and that's actually quite heartbreaking. I'm Lauren the Mortician, bringing you death facts over feelings. And if you learned something morbid today, give this video a like, hit that subscribe button, and ring the bell so you never miss another deep dive from the prep room. I mean, not physically, in spirit, in the prep room, embalming room. And remember, you can't embalm your grief. You can only face it. And I know that's hard, but it's the truth. Okay, well, this was fun. Do you want a mango kiss before you go? Okay, hold on. My foot fell asleep. I had to sit on it to like pop myself up here. Oh, come here. You need a mango kiss. Oh, what happened? They need a kiss because we talked about some dark things. So they can't go to bed yet until you give them a kiss.
Oh, and then um, I need that. Thank you. Hope you found this interesting because I sure as hell did. Okay, anyways, talk to you later. Love you. Bye.